With me to help me with this interview that we're going to do today, I have Jason on from across the pond to add some, as he says, intelligence to the podcast with his accent. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And our guest of honor today, returning, uh, actually, I think this has been five, I think it's been almost exactly five years <laughs> since you were last on the show. We have returning to the podcast author, Mr. Kevin J. Anderson. Well, oh, hello there. Glad to be back. It's been five years. I've been waiting and waiting for you guys to return my phone call, but <laughs> no, it's taken forever. It's all those numbers. Been... You just keep changing phone numbers over and over and so you can keep, you know, stay ahead of you. Well, and it wasn't until now that the restraining order was over anyway, so we're fine. <laughs> so um, we have, you know, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about because, you know, you're, you've always been writing. You've, you've never just taken a long break. You always have stuff coming out, but I know you have um, some projects that are coming out right now that you're really excited to talk about, such as uh, Spine of the Dragon, your new uh, fantasy project, which uh, is a little more interactive with the audience uh, than, than usual. So why don't you talk about that first? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I like telling stories, and if I stop writing, then my head will explode. So I, I, don't, I don't dare release the pressure of the, the creativity going on. So I've always got three or four projects that are in the works, and one that I just... Well, let me back off a little bit. Two of my really, really big series were the the Dune novels that I'm co-writing with Brian Herbert, and we've done 14 of those. And the last one of those books, called Navigators of Dune, uh, just came out last fall. And at the same time, I finished the last book in my my giant uh, space opera series called The Saga of Seven Sons. And there were uh, 12 books in that series. And the last one of that just came out last fall. So uh, rather than saying, okay, I'm done and, and retiring, I started cooking up something. What's next? The really big thing next. And I, for a long time, have been like world building and thinking about my own giant epic fantasy, sort of like Game of Thrones with dragons and lots of storylines and continents at war and all that. Uh, and so I've got one called Spine of the Dragon that I, I just finished writing the first uh, chapters, I mean, the first draft of the chapters. And it is, it's done. It's, it's uh, I mean, it needs to be polished, but it's written. But what I'm doing on this one is I've always been like very active on social media and I, I do tons and tons of conventions where I meet the fans and, and I get test readers and, and uh, take take ideas from people. So this time I kind of turned that whole idea up to 11. And and I don't really know that anybody else has done this. I've got a, a, a website that you can subscribe to. And for, for basically the price of buying the book, 30 bucks when it comes out, uh, for basically that price, you can sign up. And I'm uploading the chapters every day as I write them. So you get to look over my shoulder as I upload each draft of each chapter. And you can see the real writing process. You can see the the first draft as it comes back from the typist and um, as I edit it, we'll put up the next drafts. And once I get all the chapters up there so that there are no spoilers, uh, I'm going to put up my, my complete outline, the chapter by chapter outline, the proposal that goes off to the agent and the publishers. So it's really like an inside baseball, look over my back, look over my shoulder as I'm doing the whole thing. Uh, and then there's even a there's a higher, like a VIP level that you can have. Uh, well, I, I do all my writing with a recorder. I live in Colorado and I go out hiking almost every day and I'm on the trail for hours and I'm just dictating my chapters. And if you sign up for the VIP level, you get my raw audio files every day when I come back in. So you get to hear me, you know, panting as I'm climbing mountains and leaping over rattlesnakes and crunching through snow and wading rivers while I'm dictating stories about characters fighting dragons or going on quests into caves and everything. So anyway, it's, I, I kind of, I, I like to call it, I'm, I'm walking on a tightrope in my underwear because this is unprecedented access. You're getting to be right here when I'm writing this big epic fantasy. And it also gives you a, a, uh, a chance to read the book probably two years or so before it's going to be really published. So that's uh, my website is wordfire.com. And W-O-R-D-F-I-R-E, wordfire.com. 
And that's where the whole link is, and you can check it out and see if you're interested in that. But it's just, um, I don't know, I, I just want people to be involved in the process and maybe get them excited as as this book, you get to witness the birth of a novel. So it's, I hope people find that interesting. we got a, a dozen or so people that are already signed up and working on it, but uh, some of your listeners might be interested as well. Well, we we spawned out originally from a um, a writing website where we did collaborative writing, and so both Jeremiah and I have done writing a lot, and and a lot of our our listeners have as well. And I guess um, I'm really fascinated to see that from end to end because often people write just for fun and write little bits and pieces, but the process from end to end, you know, we interview tons of people and say, you know, talk us through that process, talk us through your creative process. Do you go and record yourself talking through things, or do you do other things? And so being able to follow that from start to finish finish sounds uh, absolutely fascinating anybody who, who's out there going oh, i wonder how i would go about it well here you go follow a pro uh, <laughs> and hopefully yeah. get inspired into actually going and, and and doing some of that stuff every day rather than going oh, i might write something next month and uh yeah get on with it sounds amazing well and i get asked all the time because it's unusual that i will i have a digital recorder so i'll just go out for a walk for hours and people go how can you write that way don't you need to type and and i go well our natural way of communicating is through speaking. You think up stuff and you talk. Uh, a lot of people don't even think before they talk, but that's a different subject. <laughs> uh, so as I'm walking, I'm thinking up the sentences and just speaking them out loud rather than sitting in a chair and thinking up the sentences. And then your brain has to break it up into individual words, which are spelled with individual letters. And then you make your fingers move around on a randomly arranged keyboard to reproduce those letters and those words and those sentences, it's it's a lot fewer steps for you to just walk and dictate out loud. So it's it's I've developed that part of it for twenty some years. So I'm as you listen to my raw audios, it's I'm I'm making up the sentences as I go along, but it's like me reading aloud a, a draft of the book. It's not I mean there's not a lot of oh ums, uh well no, change that part. It's it's pretty straightforward because I I outline very, very carefully as I go through. So that's that's the book that I've, I've just wrapped up the chapters of. We're just uploading like the last audio files, and and now I'm editing the pages as they come back from the typist and all of that. Uh, you can you can subscribe to at the wordfire.com. And also because I can't just do one thing at a time, I've got this really cool new new fantasy series that uh, I'm co-writing this novel with Sarah Hoyt, who's a, a well-known science fiction and fantasy author. And we've got it's like a alternate American history where magic works. And our our book is called Uncharted: The Lewis and Clark in the Arcane Territories. So we've got a world where an Amer America where magic works, and Lewis and Clark are basically exploring the lost world. So there's dragons and and native american shape changers and sorcerers and there's dinosaurs that attack herds of buffaloes and sea monsters in the pacific ocean and you know what more do you want um everything you can possibly that's the kind of history that i wish i had been taught in school but it's it's not quite as so i've got uh sarah's finished her draft on that one and i'm doing my edit on it so i'm I'm kind of switching my brains from editing Spine of the Dragon to edit, editing Lewis and Clark and, um, and and other things too. So can't sit still for a second. So I have a question. When you when you co-write a, a novel, you know, I've seen it done where they'd go chapter by chapter. One would do one, one would do the other chapter, and then they like switch and the one would edit the first chapter and then the other one edit the other chapter. How What is your style typically when you co-write a novel um, with another author or is it changed back and forth uh, novel to novel? Um, it really changes on who the co-author is. Uh, Brian Herbert and I have done all the Dune books together, and we've we've really got that developed in, into quite a clear art form. And we will meet together and brainstorm the entire book, start to finish. We'll spend several days. I'll be up at his house, and we'll just brainstorm and outline. And a Dune book has, you know, 100 chapters or something like that. And we'll outline it very carefully, and then when we're done, we'll, we'll just uh, – basically pick chapters. I want this one and he wants that one. And we, we split them up 50, 50. And then he writes the first draft of his chapters. And I write the first draft of my chapters and then we exchange them. And then I rewrite his stuff and he rewrites my stuff. And it goes back and forth five, six, seven times until it's pretty smooth. That's, that's like a real interactive 
collaboration. Um, what we, what is also done, like with Sarah Hoyt, she's more of a, a historian than, than I am. I have the background, but not as an expert, and she's got more of the historical background. So we plotted um, the story together, and she banged out the first draft really fast. And now I'm going through it and fleshing it out and rewriting it and polishing it. So I guess she got to do the fun part. Uh, but but that's how that collaboration works. Uh, it just You just play to your strengths. And uh, very often I've done short stories with some of my my uh, Padawan writers. I, I do a lot of writing, teaching, and, and doing workshops and stuff. And I'll have, like, one of my writers will get an assignment to do a uh, I just have one out in a brand new Planet of the Apes anthology. And so he and I uh, brainstormed the story a little bit. Uh, he wrote the first draft, and then I did the final draft, and it was done. Um, frankly, I like the writing part, so I should do it the other way around, that I write the first draft and somebody else does the, the tedious editing part. But um, I'm sure I'll figure that one out. It's it's Each collaboration is is different depending on what the skill sets of the people are. Okay. okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's, um, and you were talking about how, you know, one person's more of a, like a historian type when it reminds me of, uh, I was reading about recently, cause I was talking to Christy Golan about the Assassin's Creed novels where the author who wrote the first ones, he's a historian, but he's not a novelist. And so like, you could, you can tell through his stuff that he has the facts, right. But he doesn't have the, quite the flow of a good, of a good story. And so this is the type of one that a co-writer would be really useful with to help uh, keep the flow right. of the novel. Well, and in uh, some of the ones I've done with, uh, I've just we just sold a new high tech thriller uh, called the Doomsday Cascade. My my co author is Doug Beeson. He's a retired colonel from the Air Force. He's got a PhD in physics. He's worked in the President's Science Office. So we did a big like Tom Clancy, Michael Crichton uh, kind of thriller. I'm a really good storyteller. I know how to plot and write stories. But Doug knows the Air Force and the military, the Department of Defense and Washington, D.C. and the uh, the physics behind stuff. So he's an invaluable resource on a book like that. I, I'm not sure he'd be very good to have along for a Lewis and Clark Pike Dragons book. because It's a different set of skills. So, um, you know, this is a question that's actually gone through my head for a while because, you know, I've been reading recently your your Hellhole books also with mm -hmm. uh, your right, her yeah, with, with Herbert. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, with Dune, you have this world that, you know, there was all these notes from his dad, you know, his world was established, it was very fleshed out and detailed, and you're able to write all these stories using different aspects of, of this world and move on, it kind of moved with its own momentum. With Hellhole, you're creating a whole new universe. Was that, how was that as a different experience for you as a writer with someone you've written so long with um, to create something brand new versus utilizing a world that you guys were, have been like embedded in for so long? Well, that, that's kind of been my, my perennial existence since I started publishing, that I, I started out with writing my own original novels. My first one, uh, Resurrection Inc., came out in 1988. And so I wrote a bunch of those and got them published. And I worked with people at Bantam Books, and they, um, they liked working with me. And un unknown to me, they sent my books off to Lucasfilm to say, how about this guy writes the next set of books after Timothy's on? And they approved me and just asked if I liked Star Wars. Well, that was a good phone call. <laughs> um, and so I ended up writing for them because in my mind, I, I grew up being a fanboy. I mean, I was, I remember in like fifth and sixth grade in school out in the playground, we were playing Star Trek, you know, pretending to make up our own episodes. And, and then when we really wanted to get, get into things, we did our own Space 1999 episodes and things that we would make stuff up. So to me, as a writer, I'm making up stories. And whether I'm making up a story on Hellhole, which is my own world that I created with Brian Herbert and our own characters, or whether I'm writing Jedi Search and using Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, they're, they're the raw material that you work with. And I, I, if I was going to write a historical novel with, oh, well, duh, with Lewis and Clark, they're historical figures, right? So you do your research on the history and you try to understand what their characters are and what they would do. And then you write them as characters in your story. Um, to me, that's what I do for Star Wars or Batman and Superman or anything else that I'm working on. You just try to understand the characters. And in Star Wars or in Dune, the, the universe 
exists in, in other books or other movies. So I can look up what the Millennium Falcon looks like. If I'm going to do my hellhole books and I make up a string line carrier ship, I have to make up what that looks like. Brian and I will sketch it out or brainstorm it, but it's all part of the writer's imagination. And I've had lots of, oh, I think the technical term is artsy fartsy writers who will come up to me and say, how can you be creative and write a Star Wars book? And I'm going, well, how can you be creative writing a book set in Chicago? You have to put the streets where the streets are and the buildings where the buildings are. And, and if you're a writer, you figure out how to do it. And um, for Brian, Brian Herbert and I, when we were doing Hellhole, we had taught ourselves how to do the big plotting and the writing and the characters and the world building and the, the science and the space battles and everything. So we just, you know, changed the focus a little bit and st started over from scratch. And um, we, we love that trilogy. I think it turned out very well. It, it sure did. I absolutely agree. <laughs> I was just wondering, you know, um, one of the things you do fantastically, uh, as, as you were just saying, is is that kind of whether it's a new or old world, doing the world building, uh, establishing the, the kind of rules of, of the universe you're, you're, you're building in, um, getting those characters, building the deep characters that are coherent and consistent. Um, and it's something that, you know, Tolkien and Rowling and a bunch of other people have done very well as well. Have you ever been really tempted to just throw all of that out the window and write something with no planning and absolutely no intention to keep it coherent and logical and just throw stuff at a, at a page and see what happens? Or, you, or, or do you feel that you have to kind of spend the time getting into that, that, that deep world before writing? No, I have never for a nanosecond ever considered anything like that. There. <laughs> no, I, I have too many projects in the works at once. I've got books under contract plus other books that I want to to fit in between my other deadlines. And what you're suggesting is the kind of thing that you do as a new writer when you're trying to learn your craft and let's try this and let's try that. And uh, what what you're saying sounds horrifying to me. Like. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm, suggested, uh, yes. I'm, I'm, a brain, I'm a brain surgeon. I'm on the operating table and, well, I don't know. Let's not draw any lines or anything. Let's just start cutting and moving things and see what happens. And uh, no, no, I, I kind of, I, I like to know what I'm doing and, and where I'm going and, and what the plotting is because I've got, um, you know, the, the all the Star Wars books I did, the Dune books, the uh, my original novels. And occasionally there's something that, that I just really want to do that, that isn't under contract or isn't, um, somebody hasn't asked me for it. Uh, I did years ago when I, and I'm a fast writer. So nobody actually notices when I squeeze something else in, because if I take three months instead of two and a half months to write a novel, nobody notices and thinks that I'm slacking off. So I was using that extra, say half a month on, on a couple of years ago, uh, when I would, I would, squeeze in this extra time and I wrote completely without anybody expecting it. I wrote the first novel in my Dan Shamble zombie private investigator series because I, I love the character. I, I really wanted to write that book, but um, it wasn't my usual sort of thing. So I kind of just slipped that in and laughed all the way through. And I wrote a book called Death Warmed Over, which I surprised my agent with that saying, Here's what I did on my weekends and, and <laughs> a manuscript to sell. And we ended up doing four novels in the series and a full short story collection. And we're almost done with a uh, second short story collection. I've got the next novel outlined, but literally it's, it's, I have to find the extra half a month or two here and there to figure, to fit it in. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm too busy doing the stuff already in my head rather than trying to experiment on stuff. <laughs> so that so that actually leads into a, a question that a listener had um, that they sent me a while ago, if you ever get back on. And they, and they said, in 2014, you had four novels released, Hellhole Inferno, um, uh, The Dark Between Stars, Slimy Underbelly, and uh, Dune one. I want, uh, Men Menchats of Dune. And they want to know, if four novels of yours are released in a year, like it, does that mean they were all written at the same time or spaced out throughout a year? Or is there differences between how long it takes to edit, how long it takes to... We get from editors and so on. Did, did all four of those novels actually get written around the same time? Uh, no, don't don't look at the release schedule. The release schedule is entirely different from from the writing schedule. I mean, like like right now, if you look at 
I'm making a, it, whatever Johnny Depp is filming right now, you have no clue when that movie's going to come out. He might have three movies out in a year, but that didn't mean that he filmed them all in a year. Now, that said, sure, I probably wrote three or four novels that year. I couldn't tell you exactly which ones they were. Um, but that's kind of what I do. I have, I have a novel going at any one one time, but there's different there's different phases of it. There's the the creative part of outlining and then writing the first draft, which is fun, and then there's the analytical part where you're editing it and you're cleaning up the grammar and you're tightening your sentences. And um, now, two of the ones that you listed were with Brian Herbert. There are a hellhole one and a and a Dune one. So what happens is when we've got our stuff already written. We put all the chapters together and I'll send it to Brian. So he will spend a month or two doing the edit on Mentats of Dune. Well, that means he's working on that book so I can do a different book while I'm waiting for him to get it back to me. So then maybe I wrote Slimy Underbelly while he was doing that. And and honestly, two months to write a 70,000 word Dan Shamble book, which is really, really fun. I go out and I just, I write three or four chapters a day. It's so much fun. And that's easy to get done in, um, well, I mean, there's don't, don't when I say it, I write it in six weeks or two months, that's me putting the words down. That doesn't mean the amount of time that I spent beforehand plotting it or the amount of time that I spent afterwards editing it and polishing it. But um, and, and they're different types. So a hellhole book was very different from um, a hellhole book that I write with Brian Herbert. So we both have to be on the same page. And then I'll do a stupid Dan Shamble zombie PI book where he's trying to fight an underworld octopus demon named Achulu, who's trying to buy, he's buying the sewage or the sewers of the city so he can flood them all and have waterfront real estate. Uh, I mean, it, it's a, it's just a dumb joke filled kind of story. And then uh, the dark between the stars, which is even longer than my usual Dune books. It's my huge game of Thrones with planets kind of epic. And uh, that one came out and it uh, was on the Hugo ballot. So it's, that was a sort of a different set of my brain, but they, I just have a couple of projects rolling at any one time. Like I said, right now I've got Spine and the Dragon. I've got the Lewis and Clark in the Uncharted Territories one. Um, I, I'm doing a Dan Shamble short story probably in the next four or five days. Um, editing and polishing something. I don't even know what it is. I'm just working on the thing for today. And, uh, and, plotting some other stuff going on. So um, it's because writing is fun. It's not one of these these chores that I can groan about. Um, you know, why do I have to do this? This is the best job in the world. Awesome. And, you know, I remember you telling a story last time how, you know, you, you have published all these books, but you're also, you've gotten rewards for how many rejection letters you've gotten, at least weight-wise. <laughs> um, and so, you know, people might look at you and say, he's written over 100 novels, but he's also gotten more rejection letters than most people will ever see in their lifetime. I, I think I stopped counting at like 750 or 800 rejection slips over the over the years. But I was writing, I, there was one time I think I had 30 different short stories in the mail at once because I would just write one story after another after another. And um, I, I don't write that many stories anymore. I spend my time with novels. But uh, and, and honestly, I don't get the rejections very often anymore. So because I don't write something unless it's, it's already somebody's contracted it or they want it. Um, but it's persistence and it's sort of like, um, trying to make an Olympic, say the swim team or something. You don't just sit down and go, well, I'm going to make the Olympic swim team today, but I don't want to practice for years and years and years. I don't want to get in shape, but I want to keep at the top of my game. That's what writing does for me, that I, I don't slow down. I'm always trying to make my novels bigger or the characters deeper or the suspense more um, suspenseful or the plotting more intricate And um, because it's still fun that way. If I was just like writing the same thing over and over again, it would not be fun anymore. So I, I try to keep myself entertained. And, and fortunately, it seems that that entertains my readers too. Awesome. And you've mentioned several times that you're a fan and that's why you write in all these different universes. And right now as a fan, you have so much to enjoy that you've been involved with. You have, you know, there's more Star Wars movies coming out and you've written a lot of Star Wars. So you have those to look at and enjoy. You have a new Dune movie coming out. The first time they've done Dune in a decade and a half now, I think. I think it's about 15 years since sci-fi did, their, did theirs. 
Um, so people mm-hmm. get to see Dune again, and that, of course, will bring more attention back to your books. You have uh, a David Goyer Krypton show coming out, which looks a lot like Last Son of Krypton or Last Days of Krypton, which you wrote. Um, there just seems to be lots of stuff coming out that just seems to be wide in your real house where you can just sit back as a fan and enjoy. How do you feel as a fan with all these all these different uh, universes, you know, having uh, new projects, new things coming out that you can sit back and enjoy as a fan that you can say, I know that universe very well. Let's let's see how they do. Well, I mean, especially with, with like the DC comic stuff, I did Last Days of Krypton and I did a book called Enemies and Allies, which was the first meeting of Batman and Superman. Um, I don't want to be snarky. I can sit back and go, yeah, my books were better than that. But, you know, we can't really say that. Uh, I Again, a lot of the fans didn't like Batman versus Superman, and they keep writing me saying, why didn't they make your book? I said, well, they didn't ask. Um, the the Man of Steel with uh, uh, the story on Krypton and Jarrell, Russell Crowe as Jarrell, um, they didn't use any of, of my Krypton stuff. Uh, I kind of doubt the TV show will either, but but they can if they want to. I mean, they that's how, what you have to understand about writing for all of these things is you're just borrowing somebody else's toys. Um, I, I don't own any of the Last Days of Krypton stuff. They can make a movie of it if they want, and you don't have to. Uh, they don't have to pay me or anything. Uh, there's been a fair amount of my stuff from the Star Wars Expanded Universe that's been pulled into uh, the Clone Wars cartoons or the Rebels or the um, things that you can obviously see in Force Awakens that um, that may have been influenced by stuff from my books. The um, Rogue One, when she's digging up the plans in the tower, she she mentions the uh, the Dark Saber Project or the Black Saber Project or something, which is you know the Death Star laser from from my novel. Um, I'm not taking credit for any of this stuff. I just as a fanboy, it just makes me get a little shiver down my spine when I'm watching the movie and I go, "Oh, that's cool." I, I did this big art book with Ralph McQuarrie called the Illustrated Star Wars Universe. And- <laughs> Yep, that was really cool. And then when they did the the special editions of the original films, they just put a bunch of that artwork. They just digitized it right into the movies. So when I'm watching it, I went, holy cow, that's from our book. And it just, it, yeah, there's a fanboy, a, a fangasm, <laughs> fangasm goes on there. So it's great. I did get very excited when I saw some kind of spidery robot at at the background of Force Awakens in the distance. I was like, MT-80 is a cannon, though. Uh-huh. So, I, well, and, and uh, they had the, uh, the the Bomar monks, the brains in the jars with yeah. the walking machines. Those were in the um, uh, Clone Wars cartoons. And I mean, it's, and I love seeing this, but to me, when I'm, when I'm working for Lucasfilm and doing all that stuff, we are all part of like this, we're like Santa's elves in a toy shop. We're building and making all kinds of neat things. And and if you're one of the good elves, you don't get to go home and say, "I invented that little toy." You don't. You're all you're all taking ingredients that were there from the previous people who worked on it, and you build on that. So uh, you know all the all the novels that came after mine used the characters that we you know they're Jason and Jaina and and Tanel Khan Tahiri and and all these people that we wrote about in the Young Jedi Knights books well they grew up and did other stuff in the other books and it's just uh it's really cool to have contributed to something like that that keeps growing and building and and I haven't worked with Lucasfilm for quite a while but right now it's really exciting for me that I get to go but like when I went to see Rogue One, I thought, I don't know anything about this movie. And I'm glad because if I had worked on it, it would be boring for me because I know everything. Well, this way I got to go in and, and not know that everybody died at the end. Oops, spoiler. Sorry. Um, Everyone saw it. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how often are you uh, fearful of what comes out? I think a, a lot of uh, my time and Jeremiah's time is spent going, well, it looks really exciting, but we shouldn't get our hopes up. So it might it might not be as good as we hope it is. And, and you know, there's a June film coming out, uh, episode eight coming out um, end of this year. How much do you look forward to it with no expectations? How much do you uh, build up your hopes? And how much do you just go, oh, it's probably rubbish. I won't worry about it. <laughs> well, see the dune film that that legendary pictures is doing and the the director that they've signed on to it is denis villeneuve he did uh arrival and he's doing the new blade runner 20 whatever 2059 whatever the the number is the sequel to blade runner 
And this guy is just an insane Dune fan. He, from the moment anybody started whispering about a new Dune movie, uh, Denny was just like agitating. I want to direct it. I want to direct it. So he, he has clearly got his heart in the right place. And we just, uh, they just assigned the screenwriter that, that the director said that he wanted most in the world as the guy to work with. Um, and that's the guy who wrote, uh, he's Academy Award winning screenwriter. He wrote Forrest Gump. He also wrote the, uh, Benjamin Button. He wrote Ali. He wrote a bunch of really well-respected scripts. So the, the team coming together on this leads me to hope very, very much. And Brian Herbert and I are both, uh, co-producers, creative consultants, whatever the magic Hollywood Hollywood terms are. So we're involved in it. That that doesn't mean they'll listen to anything. But, you know, I really have high hopes for it. They they all seem to be um, saying exactly the right thing, and we're very much looking forward to it. Now, as for um, Episode 8, I, I loved Episode 7. I loved Rogue One. I, I think they, they've got themselves back on track. I... I, I probably shouldn't be quoted too much, but I, I thought that there were some parts of the uh, episode one, two, and three that that they didn't quite capture the the depth and the magic of the original Star Wars movies. And I, I think the episode seven and Rogue One really did feel like the original Star Wars movies to me. So I I have high hopes for that. And even just yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not trying to um, try, try to get you to name franchises where you weren't impressed or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, personally, I, I did enjoy um, all of the DC films that have come out to a large extent. I did have problems with some of them in different places as well. I just, I guess, if you go in with these expectations, sometimes it's quite easy to be disappointed. And I'm curious to know, do you ever get disappointed by them or do you always go in with such open expectations, even if you're hopeful about them, that, that actually you're never really disappointed? Well, let's, I mean, this, this is going to be true for probably every single one of your people who are listening, who are old enough. There was no way for those of us who waited in line for an entire day to go see the first showing of episode one, there was no way that that movie would ever meet our expectations. No matter what that movie was, we had been waiting 20 years for a new Star Wars movie. So there was no way that that could ever be as good as we had hoped. Um, and so therefore, when we watched episode seven, I think my expectations were a lot lower. I, I went to it went going, well, let's see what Disney does to this. And I went, oh, that looks and feels like Star Wars. And and I mean, who didn't cheer when the Millennium Falcon pulled out from under the, the tents and the tarps and stuff and flew off into the sky? I mean, we we all we all just felt that thrill in our in our hearts that we went, yes, it's back. And. Um, and I'm, I'm going to actually sound like an old fart here because I'm, I'm assuming most of your listeners are are not old enough to have seen the original Star Wars in the movie theater when it first came out. Uh, you might have a handful of them, but but yeah, I mean, very few people are as are as old as I am, so I'm, I'm all of fifty five. Um, but I want to emphasize something that that most Star Wars fans don't don't remember or don't understand. I was sitting in a theater in, in Madison, Wisconsin, because that's where I was going to high school and I went to college. And I just knew it was a science fiction movie. And I was sitting in the theater and, you know, it's a science fiction movie. There there weren't very many science fiction movies. So I'm sitting there and uh, the uh, fanfare goes up and the 20th Century Fox thing comes on. And then the roll up comes across and it, it's like angled across the universe as it goes across the screen. And we were all just speechless. like. Holy cow, that's really weird. We haven't seen anything like that before. And then the the blockade runner zips across. You go, ooh, that's kind of neat. And then the Star Destroyer comes, and it keeps coming, and it keeps coming, and that huge thing filling the screen. You guys cannot conceive that we had never seen anything like that ever before in all of theater. And that was just mind-blowing. And then later on when the, the Falcon goes into uh, uh, activates the hyperdrive and then the stars elongate and, and it shoots down into the tunnel. That was another one of those, I hope I brought an extra pair of underwear moments in the theater because this was stuff that is so innovative that, that it's just been imitated so many times. You can't, you can't grasp how earth-shaking that was the first time that we saw it. 
So we can hope for something like that in episode eight. And I, I fully concur. Um, you know, let's not forget, there's a, a listener question here that says, you know, I remember you talking before about, you know, you wrote a book in the StarCraft series where you actually wrote as your pen name, Gabriel uh, Mesta. And, uh, you know, later on in StarCraft II, they took some of the ideas that Chris Metzen and others developed with those books to utilize for the main plot of StarCraft II, especially later on. And they just want to know, you know, now that uh, the X-Files is coming back, they had a comeback season last year, and they announced that another one's happening. Um, as a fan of the X-Files, which you've talked about on numerous interviews, um, does this make you feel like you're back in the 90s again, seeing all these 90s stuff come back, or are you just excited to see more and more of a good thing? Well, see, X Files is a little bit different from Star Wars because Star Wars coming back, it's like it's a new Star Wars, and that's great. X Files has a has a bigger hurdle to overcome because I watched the the reboot, the whatever the six eight episodes that they did last year. Um, I'm I'm never good with numbers, that's why my wife doesn't let me balance the checkbook. But um, the problem with watching the reboot of the X Files was that when the original X Files was on this crackpot guy who would come up with fake news and weird conspiracy theories, we'd never heard stuff like that before. So it was really innovative and interesting. But when I watched the the reboot last year, Mulder spout, is spouting stuff that we all see worse things like that on our Facebook feed every hour. I mean, it, it's it's not the fact that somebody believes in aliens or the fact that somebody believes in fluoridation in your drinking water is going to turn you into a a mutant telepath or all of that kind of stuff. I mean, geez, you watch that on normal news. You watch that on your Facebook feed. So it's a little bit harder to capture that that magic because our entire culture has changed to, I don't want to say embrace because that's one of our problems. There are too much crazy fake news that people don't verify. But it's it, it's harder to come up with something that we haven't seen before. And I mean, the characters are interesting, so let's hope that they focus on that. But coming up with the crackpot theory to make an episode out of, it's going to be hard to come up with Fluke Man or or uh, the guy who can stretch and eats livers and, and things that that were completely unique and unexpected when the original show came on. Now, you know, we're we're so bombarded with crazy stuff like that. It's hard for X Files to be crazy enough to be outside the envelope. Yeah, it's hard for it to be, especially since now also you have all these shows like, say, Fringe and others that, or took stuff from the X Files and made their own universe. You know, it, it seems it almost seems like the X Files is tame, which is odd because I remember being terrified when that worm dude was in the toilet. And you're like, um, that guy is going to come up and bite you, and you're going to die. Um, Fluke Man, yeah, it was Fluke Man, right? The big, big white worm in the toilet in the sewer. Well. It I remember when when uh, my when I was in high school, I was listening to the the loud heavy metal music of Styx and Kansas <laughs> and Journey, and my parents were like, "What's that noise? You're playing it so loud!" And it was Journey, you know, uh, "Don't Stop Believing." And and that's I, I don't think that people consider that raucous heavy metal music anymore. But um, well, pop music even, <laughs> other end, yeah. yeah. So yes, I, I do a lot of oddball stuff and I am a fanboy and, and um I'm just I was at a convention last weekend that in Denver called Starfest and and it was I mean this is just it's really fun. I did twenty two shows last year. I'll be at uh Phoenix Comic Con next uh, in a month or so. Um just I was hanging out in the green room having having a bowl of cereal in the morning with Walter Koenig and we were arguing about Donald Trump. I mean, this is, I, I could make this stuff up when I was in high school wanting to be a writer and watching Star Trek and, and reading comics. So um, how much fun is that? It's fun. <laughs> and I get to be on your podcast. And that was another thing when, when I was in high school, I was just hoping that I would eventually one day get to be on the Bombad Radio podcast. And there, it's come true twice. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's, I'm glad that you're able to, to come back on. Um, Jason, before we wrap up, do you have anything else you'd like to ask before I forget? Since I know you've been talking about wanting to talk to him for 
since he was on I know Disney. I was I was I was supposed to be on the original interview and then I was busy and I am such a fan and it's been five years and no I've got a million questions and none that are worth asking so I will <laughs> I will bow to the uh, um, worth plugging the better projects it, it sounds like there's so much stuff that's coming up um, that, that's really exciting uh, um, to wait five years to have me back on you know so yeah we, we, we won't wait five years uh <laughs> We we got a we got a better system set up now, but um, so I know uh, last thing we'll have you promote. You know, I know you're you have we've talked about the books you're promoting, but you know you have a busy con schedule because convention time is just just warming up. Uh, why don't you tell people where they can uh, meet up with you and talk with you, uh, in, you know, th this summer or you know coming up this year? Because that's one thing I definitely miss when I moved from Utah. Mo leaving uh -huh. Salt Lake Comic Con was was really sad because that was such a good con, and I'd see you every time. Well, well, and I, in fact, they have like two a year, and, and this year I won't be able to make those because I'm I'm booked at other things. But I've got on the Cinco de Mayo weekend, I'm going to be at there's a a Blue Angels or a big air show at the Shreveport, uh, Louisiana. There's an Air Force base, so doing a signing there, and I'm going to be signing books at the at the air show. And then um, um, the weekend, the Memorial Day weekend, I'm going to be at uh, Phoenix Comic Con. We're going to have uh, Cheryl and Kenyon, I think Timothy's on. I know we're having Alan Dean Foster and me all at the same uh, table. Uh, there's, I mean, a lot of these are are maybe they're not entirely confirmed. There's a awesome con in Washington D.C. in the middle of June. Uh, Denver Comic Con at the end of June. Um, there's a big super con in Raleigh, North Carolina in. July I'm probably going to. There's one in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at the end of July I'm going to called Florida Supercon. Um, what else are we doing? There's Dragon Con. We always go to Dragon Con over Labor Day weekend. And a smaller con in Dallas called Fin Con at the end of September. And yes, you're reminding me, I do need to update the calendar on my website, which is also wordfire.com where you can sign up for the, uh, the Spine of the Dragon stuff. But um, I do a lot of the shows. We have other guest authors. I have a lot of books for sale, and and you know we don't charge for our autographs. We're just happy to meet fans and and uh, sell some books and and talk geeky stuff because you know most people have a slightly normal life, and then they they end up having to talk about assembly lines and taxes and stuff. But we can argue about. Um, how Doomsday was portrayed in the Batman versus Superman movie, and and whether Martha really was a good surprise or not, and stuff like that. So. <laughs> how does how does a guest like you survive at Dragon Con, which is a twenty four seven con, through the hotels? Like, do, do you actually get to sleep, or do you just kind of just like collapse occasionally? Um. Well, I don't like it when they put on me put me on like an eight a.m. panel because I'm not usually a good shape for that, but. Um, that's a very busy weekend, and, and because I am who I am, I'm not just on the Star Wars panel. I'm also on the X-Files panel. I'm on the Disasters panel. I'm on the writing panel. I'm on the publishing, well, not panels, they're tracks, and they're all in different hotels, and, and we have book signings, and I've got a table in the dealer's room, and and it's it's a frantic weekend, I'll admit that, but... Um, but I've been to every Dragon Con for like 20 years. I really love it. So um, we just, it, I'm a fanboy too. So I get to run around and look at the cosplay and I'm on panels and I meet other writer friends and, um, and you guys, a lot of different, a lot of different fans there. So yes, it's exhausting, but you know, I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on and uh, you will definitely send people your way to wordfire.com and, uh, See if I can find money to actually subscribe to the the novel too, because it's fascinating to see it go from beginning to end, especially with the edits. Because you know you might fall in love with a chapter when you read it, but then you realize when it gets edited, it just gets better. Well, that that's kind of the cool thing. Some people are are subscribing to the audio ones, and they'll listen to the audio as they read the edited chapter, and they can immediately see, oh, he cut that description out, or he fixed that part, or he tightened something up, and and you know it, that's how. That's how I learned to write was by studying and analyzing other people's writing. So um, hope somebody's somebody's interested. And it was great talking to both of you guys. Um, and we'll do it again in less than five years. <laughs> thank you so much and have a, a great day. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.